Welcome to Truth Illuminated. This is part three of a message that I'm doing entitled, Are You Absolutely Sure That Heaven Will Be Your Home? I can't think of anything in the world that's more important than this. This is the third, this is the third part. In the first two parts, and I did this really thoroughly, I, I made a list of the most common mistaken ideas that deceive many people into thinking they are a Christian when in fact they're not. And I went over this, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time with it now. You can please check out part one and part two. I believe in God. That's great, but it's not good enough. I believe the Bible. Same thing. That's very good, but it's not good enough. I'm a devout church goer. It doesn't matter if you're Catholic, Protestant. It's not good enough. I was baptized. Well, that's also very good, very important, but not essential for your salvation. So you've been baptized, you think you're okay? No, that's not. Now, I want to get back into this part right here. I, I did this at the, at the very, almost the close of part two, and I'm not going to go through the first part of what I said about it, but I've got more to say about this uh, idea that I am morally as good as I possibly could be, and so I know I'm fine. God's fair. He's just. I, he's a loving God. I'm sure he's going to understand, and everything's going to be okay. That's not what the Bible says. Now, this is very, very profound, what I'm about to share, you, share with you about sin, righteousness, and judgment. This comes out of John chapter 16, verse 5. Jesus is speaking, and this is what he says. Now I'm going to him who sent me, his father. Yet none of you ask me, where are you going? Because I have said these things, you are filled with grief. But I tell you the truth, it is for your good that I'm going away. Unless I go away, the Consular will not come to you. Now the Consular is the Holy Spirit. But if I go... I will send him to you. When he comes, listen to this closely, he, the Holy Spirit, will convict the world of guilt. Now the Holy Spirit has already come into the world in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment. Now listen for a moment. There has been literally volumes of, of books written about sin, righteousness, and judgment, and rightly so. These are three very good topics to write about, but only Jesus could take these three extreme subjects and narrow them down to one sentence, to one sentence, each word, one sentence. Only Jesus could do that. Very profound. You've got to see this. Jesus is speaking. He says, in regard to sin, because men do not believe in me. Now, just to remind you, I've started off this segment with somebody who says, I'm as morally good as I possibly can be. There's no way that I couldn't make it to heaven because I'm very morally good. Well, Jesus says that Sin, the ultimate, the ultimate sin is not believing in Him. So the question is, you feel like you're very morally good. Where is your heart, soul, belief in Jesus Christ? That's what everybody will be judged about. Now, understand this also. Not believing in Jesus Christ from our heart is the, is the absolute root of every sin that there is. When a heart does not believe in Jesus Christ, a heart is filled with everything that is against God. Outwardly, it may a person may look really sound, but inwardly, the absolute worst sin that could ever be committed is not believing from the heart in Jesus Christ. I will elaborate on that. 
Jesus goes on and he says, in regard to righteousness, now look, another, just one sentence. Because I'm going to the Father where you can see me no longer. Wow. So we summed up sin, Jesus did, in one sentence. Now we're going to sum up righteousness by the Word of God in one sentence. Look, when Jesus came to this earth, he came with an ultimate mission. That mission was to pay for your sin and mine and the sins of the entire world. And the only way that could be accomplished was for Jesus to come to this earth, born of a woman. He came in the form, he was a man. He was God in man, but he was fully man and fully God. And what he accomplished in 33 years was tremendous, absolutely tremendous. And what he, accomplished is the full, what he accomplished was the fulfillment of righteousness. The fulfillment of righteousness. That is the definition of righteousness. No one else can hold claim to that. No one except Jesus Christ. Then he goes on for the third thing and says, in regard to judgment, because the prince of this world now stands condemned. The prince, or the God with a little g of this world, is Satan himself. When Jesus fully accomplished his work, on the, what he came to earth to do, and his work on the cross, Satan was eternally condemned. Eternally condemned. So if you want to sum up these three tremendous words about sin, righteousness, and judgment, here it's done very easily. And Jesus did it in just one sentence of each word. So going back to what I actually started in part two, but I'm finishing right now. Someone says, I'm as morally good as I possibly can be. I know I'm okay. No, my dear friend, you're not okay. Please remember that sin, the core of sin, the ultimate sin is not believing and the Lord Jesus Christ. So being morally good is fine, but it's not good enough. Now let's look at the very last one about these six most common mistaken ideas that lead people to believe that they will in fact go to heaven, that they are a Christian, that they are saved. Now here's the sixth one, and many people do actually believe in this. This is extremely strong in Catholicism. A pastor or a priest prayed for me to be saved. They can pray with you. They can pray for you. But there's not a person on this earth who can pray for you to be saved. Listen, dear friend, if you are a Catholic, the Pope himself could pray over you, give you last rites, and it would not be salvation. Heaven would not be your home. It has to come from your heart and your mouth, your believing and your confessing. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5, it says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Now, listen, this is very clear. A mediator means somebody to stand in the gap. An advocate. It's like going to court and somebody steps in and, and fights for you. Well, Jesus is the only one that can. He doesn't have to fight. He's already, he's already accomplished the work. But he's the mediator. A priest is not. A pastor is not. Mary is not. Jesus Christ is the only mediator between man and God. So, somebody of very high regard in your eyes, religiously, spiritually, this person, you can say, hey, my mom and dad, my mom was just a, a tremendous child of God. She prayed for me all the time. Well, I'm going to tell you something. Her prayers were not in vain, and she prayed that you would ultimately come to salvation but her prayers did not give you salvation. So, a pastor or a priest prayed for me, okay, that's fine, 
but it's not good enough. I've discussed the six most mistaken ideas that people believe defining themselves as a Christian. And by themselves, they are very false and they are very self-deceiving. Now, I'm going to just review this quickly. I believe in God. We talked about it. It's not good enough. I believe the Bible. It's not good enough. It's great. I'm a devout church goer. It's great, but it's not good enough. I've been baptized, okay? Again, it's not good enough for your salvation. And we just talked about this. I'm as morally good as I can possibly be. Not good enough. A pastor, a priest, a dear friend, a parent, a grandma prayed for me. Listen, their prayer for you didn't give you salvation. Now, this is going to sound a little strange, all of a sudden jumping into this. I'm doing this because of what I'm about to introduce to you. I'm reminding you that in the Bible, there is 1,189 chapters. That's a lot. That's a lot. There's over 31,000 verses, 31,102 verses. The Bible is precious. If you love God, if you love the Lord Jesus, you love His Word, and you want to read His Word. You want to make it a, a constant diet living on the Word of God. I say all that because I'm going to introduce you to something, but I don't want you to think that I am narrowing this down to five verses. That's all you need to know, and you don't need to read the rest of the Bible. So that's why I'm saying this. But now, just to kind of help you here to see where we're at, where we're going. I, I've spent two and a half sessions in this, uh, doing this series on these, on these six ideas that people can have of mistaken, mistaking themselves and being a Christian. Now I am going to go through the five qualifying facts that absolutely secure your salvation. So I've taken all this time, and, and what I've done has not been in vain. But I'm leading up to this. Now I'm going to show you, but look, there's only five verses only five verses in the entire Bible that if you really, really understand from your heart these five verses and you apply, you see that word emphasized, and apply these verses to your life, this is the end result. You will have absolute assurance of salvation and heaven will in fact be your home. Glory be to God. Now, these are the five key words, and then we're going to look at the verses. Believe. Now, you said, Todd, you say, Todd, wait a minute. You've spent all this time saying that that's not enough. You know what? I was talking about the kind of belief that most people have that's not good enough. We're going to get into believing the way God defines believing. Then we're going to look at repent, repentance, genuine repentance, receiving what it means to receive Jesus Christ. Confess. The Bible says that we need to confess Jesus, what that really means. And then the fifth one is ownership. Now, I'm going to go through each one very thoroughly, but there they are. These five things right here is, is going to give you absolute assurance of your salvation. Now, this is really neat. You see this treasure box. This is a golden treasure box. When, to, when true belief comes from the heart, the core of your soul is opened up like this, like this treasure chest. And the other four, which is repent, receive, confess, and changing of ownership will pour out of this treasure chest when believing is the way that God wants it to be. It's beautiful. It's absolutely beautiful. So we're going to start right here with belief. We're going to define it. Now, now let's just remember, believing in God, I made that crystal clear. Believing in God is not good enough. This is the kind of belief that the Bible's talking about. 
we need to go to Romans chapter 10, verse 9, and let's read it. That if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe where? In your heart, in your heart, that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. And it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. Wow. When you believe from your heart, and, and I'll explain more, that's your justification. All the effort in the world that you, could, that you, may, that you might labor over, labor over, and labor over. No, no. It's when you believe from the heart that you're justified. You know, anytime I can do this, anytime I can use something graphical, vision, something, something that I can picture, make a vision, I love it, and you will remember it. Now, how close can I come to heaven and miss it? And miss it. You know, a lot of people ask it just the other, other way around. You know, how far can I go and still make heaven. <laughs> that type of person really needs to get saved for real. But the question is, how close can I come to heaven and miss it? Well, let's make it graphical. Let's make it real graphical. Now, I'm, I don't know if the, how clear this is going to come through to what your, your phone, your TV, your iPad, whatever you're watching. This is a tape measure. <laughs> this is a tape measure. You say, Todd, yeah. And you know what? It can be a real small tape measure, because that's how close you can come to heaven and miss it. So let's have a starting point, and let's measure a certain distance. Now that distance happens to be 14 inches. You say, what in the world is 14 inches? I used to tell people 18 inches, and then I got wondering, you know, I wonder if I'm really right about this. <clears throat> so I, I checked it out, and I was wrong. The average adult from your head to your heart is between 12 and 14 inches. That's how close you can come to heaven and miss it. Now, I don't know how to emphasize this so strongly, but you, you just gotta see this. You gotta see this. The difference is mental ascent, having it in your head but not having it in your heart. Quickly, I know I, I have a temptation to chase rabbits, and, I, and I've got to really watch myself to not do it. The Bible says that hell is enlarging itself. Hell was created for the devil and his angels. Remember the rich man in Lazarus? He would have given anything in the world. He was already in hell, and he was in torment. It was real. And I'm not saying that he came that close. I don't know how, I don't know if he ever believed in God, but I, I have been taking a lot of time to show you that you can believe in God. And you know where it's at? It's in your head, mental ascent. But when it's in your heart, that's when you're transformed. That's when you're born again. So that's how close you can come. Now, the average church member has given little more than mental ascent to Jesus' word. You say, Todd, that's, that's being very harsh. It's very true. It is very, very true. Mental ascent is not going to save you. Here we go. I love graphics. So here's another one. Here's a heart on the left. There's your head knowledge on the right. Faith from the heart versus mental ascent. So let's talk about it for a minute. This is extremely important. I want to give you an example of mental ascent, okay? This comes from James chapter 1, verse 22. It says, it says, Do not merely listen to the word, and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Prime example of mental ascent. I wonder how many people in churches every Sunday give mental ascent to what's being shared, spoken, taught, without ever wanting to put it into practice. <clears throat> Excuse me. Here's another one. Ezekiel 33, 30. Tremendous, tremendous passage of Scripture. Now the Lord is speaking to this prophet. As for you, son of man, 
Your countrymen are talking about you by the walls and at the doors of the houses. In other words, popular discussion. He was a popular man, but he was a man of God. He was a prophet of God. And they're saying to each other, come and hear the message that has come from the Lord. Now that sounds like somebody thoroughly interested in hearing the word of God. My people come to you, as they usually do, it's a habit, and sit before you to listen to your words. But they do not put them into practice. With their mouths, they express devotion, but their hearts are greedy for unjust gain. Indeed, to them, you are nothing more than one who sings love songs with a beautiful voice and plays an instrument well. For they hear your words, but do not put them into practice. Exactly the same thing that James was saying. That, my friend, is mental assent. Mental assent. When you look critically at many of our Christian lives, you'll notice that most people have the mental assent that God exists, but actually do not have faith in Almighty God. Look at that. Most people have the mental assent that God exists. That's true. We labored on that point in a previous part of this session. Mental assent looks so much like faith that many people cannot see the difference between the two. Let me give you another example. Look, faith from the heart. This gives you an idea of what it looks like. Look at this precious lady bowing down, holding up her broken heart. I hope that graphically you can really see this. Whether it be a man or a woman, a child, look at this. So humble, so broken, kneeling down, and, and holding up this heart, representing God. I'm just, I'm pouring my heart out to you. My heart's broken. Jesus, I need you. I do believe in my heart that you died for me. I believe you died for me. I give you my broken heart. Listen, my friend, that's not mental assent. You see that? That's not mental assent. That's from the heart. Here again, we see something from the heart. In Matthew 13, 44, Jesus is speaking. He says, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again. And then in his joy, went and sold all that he had and bought that field. Now, it's so easy to interpret this, what Jesus is saying. To begin with, the kingdom of God is a treasure. Knowing Jesus Christ is a treasure. You find this treasure, and it says in this short parable, he goes and hides it. What that means is he puts it in a place where nothing can happen to it. Nobody can take it. It can't be lost. He, it's, it's treasured, and he's protecting it. And then, out of his joy, he goes and sells everything he has and buys that field. You know what this simply means? When you are believing from your heart and you receive Jesus, he becomes the absolute pearl, the treasure of great price in your life, and you will get rid of everything that stands in the way. Now, if you have mental assent, you won't dare do that. You, won't, you might try to give God just a small portion, but you won't give him all. Here's another one. It's right below it in the next verse. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. It's the same thing. It's exactly the same thing. Faith from the heart reaches out to Jesus Christ, realizes he's the treasure above all treasures. He's the pearl of great price. We'll get rid of everything that would stand in the way and holds dearly to that treasure. Faith from the heart. Here it is. Faith from the heart is life-changing, will never, never be ashamed, will make any sacrifice for Jesus Christ, will love God's Word, 
will share Jesus with other people. I don't know how to explain to you in simpler terms the difference between mental assent and faith coming from the heart. Dear friend, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for watching this. And I don't know if you did see part one and part two. Please, if you haven't, please do it. Because parts one and two lay a foundation for seeing this part in even, a, even in a greater way. I encourage you, please, to come back for part four. And I know that you will really enjoy it. Uh, I'll say this. I have just a few moments left. I have to keep this below 30 minutes. And so that's a good time anyway. People have told me they like that. When I first started this, I thought it was going to be a short series. I don't know how long it's going to go. But listen, this is who I am. This is who God made me. And this is the gifting he's given me. I want to be as thorough as I possibly can be. I do not take two or three words from a verse and then spend another 30 minutes giving you my opinions and just going on and on. I want to go line by line, word by word, in God's Word, and let His Word, let His Word speak to your heart. Thank you again so much. God bless you greatly for being with me.